Welcome to Hard Talk. Uh, I'm here in Sydney, Australia, and uh, with me here today is the Executive Director of the Victor Chang Research Institute and uh, one of the main pioneering people that have got this research center to where it is today. So uh, I want to just welcome Professor Graham. Welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you very much. Good. Yeah. Um, allow me to just start uh, by, by just finding out a little bit more about the man himself, Dr. Victor Chang. Uh, I know that you worked with him for about a year in 1974. Sure. Uh, maybe just an insight about the man and, and the pulse that is keeping this research institute going for the last, what, 22 years, just July 4th, will right. make it 22 years. So maybe a bit of insight about the man himself. Yes, look, uh, I knew Victor not really well, but uh, I did overlap with him for a year because I was a young doctor and he had just recently come back from training in both England and the United States at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, to become one of the cardiothoracic surgeons here. There were two very well-known surgeons before, Harry Windsor and Mark Shanahan, who actually had done the, uh, a heart transplant in 1968, only a year after Christian Barnard did the first one in 67. And I was a medical student at the time and helped to look after the patient. He actually, technically the operation went very well, but uh, we didn't have good immunosuppressive drugs and he died about uh, two weeks later of a rare infection, serratia, which only affects you if you're immunosuppressed. Right. So it was, uh, uh, it was sad, but uh, technically things went well. But the whole world realized then that we couldn't do heart transplants because we didn't have the right drugs, we didn't know how to biopsy the heart safely to look for a rejection. Mm -hmm. And it all fell into abeyance everywhere. And it turned out that Victor came back, and uh, that was in about 1974, he came back from right. training. And in the early 80s, a new drug came available, cyclosporin, right. which we actually don't use that much now because we've subsequently realized it's quite nephrotoxic, yeah? but uh, it allowed the whole era of transplantation to start up again in the early 80s. Mm -hmm. And Victor was a very dynamic person and was able to get the government to, to get some support and to start the whole transplant program up in Australia. And so St Vincent's Hospital was the first hospital to become a designated center of excellence for heart transplantation. Victor was a very interesting person. He came from a, a obviously Chinese background. He was born in Guangzhou province. His parents actually though had lived in Australia before and went back to China where he was born. And he lived there until he was about 16 and then came to Australia, went to uh, Lewisham Boys High School, did very well and did medicine. Uh, and then he went off, he after training uh, here in Australia, he went off overseas and got trained in, in cardiothoracic surgery and actually have met some of these people he trained with and he was actually a very, very good student, uh, and he came Must back have been, here yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and started up the program, the mm -hmm. heart transplant program. And so we, as I said, we overlapped for a year and I helped look after his patients. Yeah? And I guess the, uh, the one characteristic about Victor, apart from the fact that he uh, was obviously a very, very good gifted surgeon, was he, was, he, was, he had enormous charisma and uh, he had a big beaming smile uh, uh, he's sort of a, he was fairly extroverted, which was sort of unusual for Asian people, but he was very extroverted. Yeah? Right. Um, and he would immediately uh, embrace you with uh, warmth. Yeah? So he, and he had a great feeling not only for the patients, but compassion for the uh, relatives of the people who had donated the heart, who obviously had died. Yeah? Yeah. Um, so he, he uh, was able to uh, sell coal to the devil at a dollar more than the going price. <laughs> and, sure, yeah. and he did a great job of setting up the transplant program and pioneering heart transplantation worldwide in that second generation in the early 80s. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So um, St Vincent's Hospital, uh, the way the institute got going was that St Vincent's Hospital for many years uh, had uh, done excellent clinical uh, work obviously in clinical research mm -hmm. to support that right. and some physiological research but really didn't have a, a nidus of, of basic science research to support the clinical activities. Yeah. Yeah. And just before he died or before his tragic uh, death, uh, Victor in the 1990 actually had started a, a, a program to try and raise money for mm -hmm. a research institute amongst other things and right. also to get more beds and uh, mm -hmm. more equipment. And he succeeded in getting the more beds and more equipment, but uh, unfortunately his life was tragically cut short. So he'd also operated on Kerry Packer, and Kerry Packer kindly uh, put in $3 million, and the federal government put in $3 million. That's how we started in, uh, in 1994. 
Okay. Uh, only two years, three years after Victor's tragic death. Yeah? Uh, yeah. And the, the whole idea of the Institute was to develop a basic research program that mm -hmm. could complement the clinical work that was done at the hospital. Right. And be, actually before I was recruited to come back from the United States where I had been for 17 years, right. it was decided that we should have a single focus. It's no good having too many areas mm -hmm. and that, that focus it would make sense to be in the area of heart muscle diseases because that's what causes uh, that leads on to transplantation, heart failure and transplantation. And that's what we did. Right. And that's uh, how we started. started. Yeah. But this is interesting because Dr. Victor Chan being a Chinese mm -hmm. and I'm from South Asia, the mm -hmm. Sri Lankan, and we come from Malaysia where we've got Chinese, Indians, you know, all sorts of different races. Mm -hmm. And yet, for example, in Australia, heart disease is the main killer in both males and females and even in our country. And with all the research, myself as a doctor, mm -hmm. um, it's amazing that we, we know the risk factors from the day we were in medical school, mm -hmm. and yet to be hit with a with a, a diagnosis that you've got you know advanced heart disease. Mm -hmm. Tell me, after all these years of research and being exposed to you know with the work and all that, uh, how can this disease be still a silent killer that's just you know like a tsunami going underneath and then it hits you? Um, are we missing something somewhere? Well, I mean, it's, it's interesting actually that uh, we're now realizing that it's not just uh, in the developed world that this is a problem, but in the developing world. I mean, in many areas of India, for example, right. despite the fact that they're relatively, compared to our standards, are very malnourished, they still have very bad high cholesterol problems and mm -hmm. they're getting uh, high potential, high blood pressure problems and they're getting premature cardiovascular disease. And that's what's starting to kill them and it's estimated by 2025 heart disease will be the number one killer not just in the western world but worldwide right. uh, accounting for some 23 percent of death which is just shocking actually uh, so we need to get smart the other the other problem is that uh, while we've got very very good at treating heart disease especially if you can get it early of course if you don't get it early enough and the heart some you lose some heart muscle which is what happens when you have a heart attack you block off one of the main arteries supplying blood to the heart. If once you've lost that heart muscle, there's a very limited ability, uh, we thought there was none at all until a few years ago, but there is some limited ability for regeneration of heart muscle cells, mm -hmm. but it's very poor. Right. And a lot of us now, a lot of our own programs here are focusing on how can we bolster that regenerative capacity of the heart. Uh, so we have a lot to learn yet in being able to treat this well. So if you get it early, you can do a lot. Uh, I mean, it used to be that if you had a heart attack and got to a major teaching hospital such as St Vincent's, uh, when I was a medical student, about 75% of people would survive. Right. These days, 95% plus survive. And we're very good at opening up the blocked artery and treating that and putting stents in or bypasses in right. and supporting the patient during uh, some procedures when the heart isn't working very well. Yeah. But if they if they don't get to hospital in time and they lose heart muscle, then you're left with a patient who is inevitably going to go into heart failure. And that still carries a five year, 50% uh, mortality rate. So this is worse than most cancers actually. This is, uh, this is a highlight of uh, getting you know, aware early, and catching it early. I mean, I, I, had, I didn't have any symptoms at all. Right. And I realize now that when I get onto the websites and I listen to all the forums that are going on across the world, sure. and I realize that many like me, who, uh, who don't have any symptoms, I don't know what it is to have a chest pain mm. because you know your treadmill is normal, your echo is yeah. normal yeah. and then your blood pressure goes a bit uh, you know, uh, out of control so to speak and I was really excited when I read your Graham laboratory mm -hmm. and the work that you're doing with blood pressure and, and muscle hypertrophy and all that so now we, when, when those who are listening in uh, who have got vein grafts in the heart mm -hmm. doing the, the replacing the work of arteries mm -hmm. Um, how does that? How do we keep that in check so that you know it isn't that there's a lifespan now? When you're confronted with mortality, suddenly you realize that it, it can be quite scary. Sure, sure. So, Professor, could you just highlight us of how we can keep those veins going, or do we have a better understanding? I mean, an ejection fraction is normal. Sure. Heart muscle is normal. You're on a good, good platform. Where do we go from here? I mean, this is. Well, be you've touched on a number of issues that are, <clears throat> it's going to be hard for me to address all sure. of them, but. 
But just to start off, I mean, one of the problems we have when you say silent killer, it can be silent, but it can also cause pain. It's not like high blood pressure, which really is silent, a silent killer. That's what traditionally is called a silent killer, because you don't know you've got it often. Right. I mean, very few people get a headache, some do, but others get very non-specific symptoms or none at all. Right. But in terms of heart disease, it'll often clear itself and you'll get some chest pain, although sometimes it doesn't, or the pain is atypical and it gets missed. And it's not like uh, breast cancer where you can just do a mammogram and uh, in most cases, although it's not 100% the mammogram, it's pretty good. You can either rule in or rule out that okay. you've got breast cancer. Yeah? With heart disease, it's hard because if you do a stress test, yeah. which is a functional test to see whether there's a limitation of blood flow going to the heart, mm -hmm. there's a quite a high false positive and false negative rate. Yeah? So you can go to the next level now, you can do a, a, a scan, so you use a radionuclei together with the stress test to yeah. see if you can see areas that are underperfused, they're not getting enough blood supply. Yeah? And again, that's got a high false positive, false negative, especially in somebody who's asymptomatic. Yeah? Yeah. Um, and, and so then you go to the next level, you know, and you can, now we have wonderful tool we have here, which is a CT coronary angiogram, yeah. but it's not cheap, it's expensive. Mm -hmm. And uh, the radiation used to be a problem. The machine's now so good that the amount of radiation yes. is not much more than flying to Europe and back. Right. So we've got, we've got that under control. So we do have many ways of, of getting to it, but it's not simple. The best thing one can do is, first of all, choose your parents carefully. <laughs> yeah, we should go to a wine bag as well. <laughs> and then to at least be sensible that once you're over the age of 40, 45, they have regular checkups. And certainly if you can check your cholesterol and your blood sugars and your blood pressure, right. that's, a, that's a huge majority of the risk that we all carry, apart from family history and age. Sure. So they're the five major five culprits that we need to look at. Yeah? And uh, if there's any suspicion, uh, or if you have, say, a bad family history, or if you've got diabetes, or if you're overweight, sure. or if you're not exercising, you need to be even more diligent. Yeah? Sure. Sure. And so it's, uh, it's a matter of being very diligent about the fact that we can get it. And when we're 30 and 40, we think we're invincible. And then yeah, once right. you get to your age, you sort of forget about it. And yeah. you think it's not I'm still 30, you. 40, so you know, I'm gonna yeah. stay that way. <laughs> Finally, um, Coming back to research, which mm. is the pulse of this whole institute, mm. sure. um, there are two areas which are really exciting, and that is genetics. Mm. Uh, because, you know, they, they keep telling me, it's your genes, Charles, it's mm. your genes, and I can't change them. Sure. Um, and and the, the, the final frontier of uh, stem cell research and, mm. and how we can get onto that. Would you be able to just put in some insight about the genetics part of it? and? Yeah. In this particular field here in the research? Well, it's, it's, it's a somewhat paradoxical yeah. in that uh, the majority of genetic disorders that lead to heart disease are really multifactorial. Sure. There's probably many genes involved, and it's rare to find single gene disorders that cause heart disease, although there are some. But despite the fact that it's very rare, if you look at the example, uh, say, of high cholesterol, mm -hmm. where a single protein, the LDL receptor right. gene, was discovered by Goldstein and Brown, mm -hmm. and although not many people have, relatively few people have familial hypercholesterolemia, which is a very severe disease with very severe increases in cholesterol, mm -hmm. it was a paradigm. It allowed us to start to understand how cholesterol is handled in the body. Right. So if we can get to genetic diseases, even though they may be very rare, they teach us a lot about the common garden variety disorders, which are due to multiple genes, not just one. And they start to allow us to home in on the pathways and the molecular mechanisms that give rise to disorders. So that's why they're important. Additionally, once you've got a gene out, you can now make an animal model and, and really ask the question in a very definitive way, does a mutation or a defect in that gene cause heart disease and what sort of heart disease and how does it manifest itself? Mm -hmm. So you can ask some very poignant questions. Now you've also got a, an animal model where you can start to do, uh, develop drugs and see if you can change the course of that disease. So mm -hmm. having a genetic approach is a very, very powerful thing. Yeah? We also probably underestimated when I say that the single gene defects are rare, they probably are, but they're more common than we realize. We just, mm -hmm. until we had the whole genome out, uh, we didn't right. realize it. And we've got much better now at sequencing the genome. You know, we can sequence an entire genome in two or three days yeah, at a cost that's approaching $1,000, yeah, which still is a lot of money, but it's allowing, sure. opening up and 
allowing the spectrum of personalized medicine to come to the fore, at least in developed countries. I think it'll be a long time before it's, uh, sure. it's good for other developed <coughs> countries. Uh, on the negative side, of course, humans are very outbred. And by that I mean that we, we, we marry fairly freely. I mean, there are some cultural mores that people don't like to marry. But by and large, compared to the laboratory animals, which are very inbred, and we deliberately inbreed them because we don't want genetic variation to, to obscure the results that we find. It's much harder in humans because they are outbred. Yeah, you know? right. I often say the best thing that drug companies who are trying to develop a blood pressure lowering tablet could do is not to use inbred strains of rats, but go to McDonald's and get the rats <laughs> that live under McDonald's. Right. And if it lowers pressure on them, then you're okay. Yeah, they, right. they approximate humans a lot better. You know? yeah, 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 I mean, yeah. I'm being tongue in cheek, but it's very <laughs> important to realize that, sure. that our research is very structured. We have to do it if we want to get some meaningful sure. answers. But it has uh, the applicability then will come in testing outbred strains. Yeah. You know, it's fantastic because uh, if you don't mind me just, just sure. going on that line, when I saw my CD scans mm. and I saw the vessels which were moth-eaten mm -hmm. and I told myself what a fascinating uh, uh, you know, organ we have, the muscle where we've got collaterals that have been going all mm. this while, feeding the heart muscle and, and I wish that there was well, some... Well you're very sort of, lucky that I, you developed collateral. Some people don't have time to I develop I know it. and that's why I'm here yeah. with you because right. you know, I thought this is, this is really a, a run but yeah. the way the disease you know, eats up the vessel sure. and then misses the left main stem mm. That to me will be the next yeah, frontier sure. as to why this disease has this pretty Well, we know a lot, and I think that's the other major frontier that I'm proud that we've now developed in the Institute only recently, and that mm -hmm. is the vascular side of the cardiovascular. This is right. And we've just got a very prestigious scientist now who's joined us, Professor Roald Stocker, mm -hmm. and his whole group just focuses on the vascular biology. There you are. How, why is it, as you say, that you get these plaques forming in certain places? Right. We know, for example, they always occur just distal to the uh, to the uh, the little tiny blood vessels that feed the blood vessels themselves. You know? mm -hmm. So uh, they, they and it's got to do with the way the blood flows that right. you get the the deposition of the plaque in the arteries. You know? Yeah. So it's it's not uh, a, a, a completely random. Uh, there is some understanding that has to go on, and we are right. trying to understand those areas at a very basic level. Uh, well, this way. is this is exciting yeah. and, and I just want to congratulate you and the 130 over scientists that are in this whole institute. Sure. Yeah. And, and finally as, as, the, as the end of this talk with you, sir, how do you see the next 20 years? I mean uh, there must be something in your heart that's pulsating and you want to leave it on. For the next uh, for the next run for this um, yeah look uh, where do you, uh, where do you I see, I going? see uh, our institute has two major roles I mean we have many roles but two major roles one is to really push forward the frontiers of biology right. in the cardiovascular area right. to really understand things at a very mechanistic level I'm not interested in research that's here today gone tomorrow I right. like what I call Rosetta Stone research where we can build on uh, building blocks Absolutely. and that's why we try to publish in the best journals. We really try to do high caliber research that will, will lead to new well, ways of looking at things yeah. and thinking about things and hopefully new, very powerful new treatments in the future. Yeah? Right. So that's one major area we have and the second of course is to translate that rapidly into new diagnostics and treatments for people. Right. Uh, and people are, are very important to us. I mean, that's why we do the work. Absolutely. We don't just do it because of intellectual curiosity. We do it right. because we're trying to treat, prevent suffering, pain and suffering. So they're the two major goals, and I'd like to see us uh, uh, really expand on those two areas uh, and to build even more than what we have already over the next five years to really take that and develop some very powerful new understandings and hopefully treatments or diagnostics. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, with that, Professor Robert Graham, thank you very much for Pleasure. doing the hard talk. Thanks for coming. Thank you.